Enrico <coughs> is, uh, I'm calling for an anglais, is a professor of economics at uh, Brescia University, Italy. His research is in the area of micro theory, but over the years, thanks to Aviad Heifetz, he has been reading and thinking about the social and political aspects of Simon Weil's thought. So listening to Enrico will be another way that uh, we take uh, good advantage of the influence of Aviad. Thank you. So thank you to Aviad and also to Dennis for the organization of the conference and to you all for uh, this discussion. Okay, so th the title is a bit ambitious, okay, The Roots of Democracy, but actually what uh, I'm going to do today and more generally our joint project, in a sense, is a very modest exercise because it's an exercise in translation between two languages, the languages of uh, roles, which for us as economists, okay, because uh, we have been collaborating before this project on really economic theory, okay, me and Aviat, okay, uh, in a sense, roles is already a very rich language with respect to the one that we use in day-by-day -day activity as economists. But with Aviat, we were nevertheless uh, very much impressed when we started reading Simone Weil, Simone Weil some years ago, that she, in a sense, okay, uh, was facing similar question with a much richer language. Okay, so what we have been trying to do is a, a bit connect the language of roles and the language of uh, Simone Weil. Of course, each time you do a translation, there is also a bit of reduction, okay, in the sense that uh, I was listening to the talks this morning, and it is true that in Simon Veil there is this, uh, it's, it's like a, I don't know, a fire, okay, a fire of language, okay, and uh, it came out, especially I think in the, in the talk of uh, Robert Chenavier, this incredible tension between uh, uh, this notion of uh, an absolute good and then the willingness to translate this into practical uh, implications, okay. In a sense, roles, okay, you could say he also had a fire inside, and there are some interesting aspects also of, uh, of his own life, but uh, he, the level of uh, freezing of the language is much stronger, okay? So this book, I think it's uh, an incredible, interesting uh, reading. It's, the, it's a short uh, presentation of his theory that he did uh, when he was uh, already old, and it's an effort at objectivity and coolness of the language, which I think is admirable. And okay, what we have been trying to do was connect a bit these two languages, and I'm trying, um, okay. We have a published paper on this, uh, which I will not describe in, uh, in detail today, but I just put uh, one slide, okay. This is what we tried to do in this published paper that uh, was published a couple of years ago. We try to make the point that uh, Simon Weil and Ross had a similar, some similar uh, characteristics okay, in, the, in their development. Okay? When we talk about Simon Weil, we are only talking about uh, a specific part of her thought, which is basically the parts of the need for roots. Then there is these drafts for uh, a declaration of uh, uh, human rights, uh, human um, Okay, the title, I don't remember. Okay, it's called uh, uh, um, Prologue. Uh, in, in English, it's a draft for obligations. I don't remember, okay. And then, of course, the main source of what we read is uh, the essay Human Personality, okay, which is, uh, I think, very rich. And uh, we're going to, to quote mainly from Human Personality. Okay, so what we try to argue in this written paper that is published is that uh, they, the problem that both Rawls and Simon Weil were facing was uh, similar in the sense that uh, it's a problem of uh, how to inspire a people to, uh, to uh, really um, believe in a constitution. So it's not really the problem of writing a constitution, it's also this problem. But it's a secondary problem. It's, suppose we have written a constitution. How do we make people believe in the constitution, really adhere to the principles that are expressed in the constitution? This is, uh, uh, Simone Weil uses the word donner l'inspiration, okay? And uh, uh, Rawls has a whole part of the book which is called, in a much cooler language, 
the problem of stability, but it's exactly the same problem. So the problem is how do we inspire people to uh, believe in the principle expressed in the Constitution? So that's point A. Point B is that both Ross and Simon Weil, and for Simon Weil, it came out very well, I think, in the discussion uh, yesterday, but today also. The notion of roots, okay, uh, is expressed in, f in a form of multiple roots, okay? So there is this uh, very clear um, recognition that uh, our societies are complex societies and people have different, belong they belong to different uh, milieu, okay? And uh, this is what Rawls calls the fact of pluralism. The fact that uh, uh, in a society you have people uh, which belong, maybe even one person can belong to different uh, uh, cultures, but there are different cultures and they merit respect. Okay? So I, I will not dwell into e each of these points because this is in the published paper, I, I just go very quickly on this. The, s the third uh, fact uh, that we found uh, similar in the two uh, development is that both Rawls and Simon Weil were very keen in looking for some impersonal principle of justice. Okay? Now, what we did in that paper was to k motivate a bit this uh, discussion and then to focus on a difference in language. The fact that, uh, uh, mm, you know, Rawls talks about rights and he talks about primary goods, okay, where the, the word goods already contains an issue of scarcity and the possibility of sharing and, uh, you know, property, okay. While Simon Weil talks about the needs of the soul, okay? So we were discussing these differences in language. Even here, you can, if you want to read the paper, I will skip this. What I'm going to do today is a different thing, is the following. When we were presenting this paper, especially to economists, okay? The general attitude is very interesting, but this is poetry. This is a spiritual discussion. It has nothing to do with uh, either economics or politics, okay? So again, we were talking to very specific audiences, the, the audience of people studying economics, uh, and okay, economists also do mathematical model of politics, okay? So they, there is a branch of economics which does mathematical model of politics. So they found this language incomprehensible, okay? So, what I will try to do today is the following single point, which is to take the language of Rawls, which the economist somehow accepted. So this is, Rawls is like the, the richest possible language that economists accept, okay? And I'm going to do this exercise, which is to say, okay, if you take the theory of justice, or this book, Justice as Fairness, it's a specific theory, okay? which is very different from Simon Weil. Now, I want to argue that uh, the logical structure that Rawls developed before introducing his own theory, okay, and I will call this, I mean, I'm using mostly his language, okay? I want to be close to his language because I want to do this translation, so, okay. What I will call political liberal theories is a wider class of theories of which Rawls is just one. And I want to argue that uh, some aspects of Simon Weil's can be very useful for a richer political liberal theory. Okay, so this is the aim of what I'm going to do in the next uh, 10 or 15 minutes, okay? So to argue that uh, I'm not claiming that Rawls theories is you know, in encompassing Simon Weil theory, I'm not claiming this, I'm claiming that he, the language that he uses, which, okay, is less uh, thick or less uh, engaging than Simon Weil, nevertheless is rich enough to be subject to the influence, to use a word that was, uh, I think, used by Pascal David this morning, the influence of Simon Weil thought, okay? So I want to argue that there is a work to be done, and, okay, and so, to do this, I will first sketch this abstract model of Rawls' theory, and then I will uh, discuss the specific meaning that Rawls gives to fair, but on this I will be quick, I mean, because it's not, uh, we're not talking about his theory, and then say something about Simon Weil's language. Okay, so the most important part, I think, is to understand that uh, uh, Rawls, uh, in the beginning of the book, 
He says, I, want, I will not talk about ethics, I will not talk about moral philosophy, I will talk about a political theory of justice. He uses the word political in a specific meaning that he defines very precisely. So, he says, what is the context? Again, the context is the fact that we live in society which, uh, in which there are many theories of the good, so we don't have one theory of what is good for humanity, we have many, but we need to have some shared system of cooperation to, uh, to make a democracy function. And what are the challenges in general? We have to define some legitimate principle, and legitimate, okay, you have to define what it means, and we want to argue that this principle should be stable, should be motivating for the people living in the society to adhere to this principle. You see, these are very abstract words, okay? Nobody has, tell me, has told what legitimate means, what stable means. And I'm arguing that what he does is one version of this, okay? So justice as fairness, this book, is one political theory. So, and he is very precise, okay? So he says, what is a political conception of justice as opposed to a moral, ethical theory? A political conception of justice, first of all, it has a limited domain, okay? We are not talking about justice in the family. We are not talking about justice between parents and children. We're talking about a constitution for a country, okay? So the basic structure, it means the constitution, the law, the, the, the structure of the state, if you want, okay? So first thing, a political conception of justice is about these constitutional essential principles. Second, it is not a comprehensive doctrine. So it's not a religious view of the world, it's not a fully articulated philosophical view of what is good and what is bad, what is a human being, what is mind, what is... Uh, no, it's not this, okay? So what is this? Okay, it is a discussion of the basic structure of society which uses fundamental ideas which are taken from the language of human interaction in a society. And he says, in particular, the language that we need to use is what do people mean to be free and equal citizens, and what do people mean to live in a fair system, okay? But again, free and equal, fair, are not defined. These are terms which are there to define what is the language that we want to use. Okay, now, oops. So his idea is that uh, if we have many different views of uh, what is a good for humans, we can nevertheless construct an overlapping consensus, uh, consensus among these views on the particular issue of the constitutional uh, setting of society. And here I want to discuss one second his method, okay? His method, which I call the projection, because this is like in mathematics when you start from uh, a cube and you go into a plane, okay? You do a projection on a lower dimensional space. And he does this, okay, he does this, he says, let's define a very specific subspace in which it's not only the issues of the subspace, but it's only the also the language which has to be very properly limited. We find an agreement on the subspace, and then each one will take this agreement which is defined here and, you know, will adhere to this with his own particular view, okay? So this is what he calls the overlapping consensus, and uh, he, he says that that's enough for stability. For stability in a society, it is enough that we all go into this very low dimensional space, we agree there, and then we look at the things from outside and we say, ah, very good, I like this, you like this, we all like this, we are happy, okay? That's his method. Now, okay, this is the abstract version of what he does. Now, the particular version that he calls justice as fairness, I, again, again I want to say one thing about this, is that uh, he, he defines that free and equal, in his theory, so not in general, in his own view, free and equal basically means reasonable, okay? So people are reasonable in the sense that they are rational and they accept the fact of dialogue between rational people. So I accept that I will limit my self-interest because I understand that we have to reach an agreement. So I'm not purely selfish. I am reasonable in the sense that we all share the need to reach an agreement. 
For him, that's it, okay? To be free and equal, if you reduce it to the essential, means that you are reasonable. And what is fair? Okay, this is even more famous, okay? This is the, the very famous part of his theory. He says, what does it mean that we reach a fair agreement? Well, he has this idea that he takes from a long tradition in philosophy, but he develops, again, he is very careful, okay? everything is well defined. So he says, a fair agreement is what could be reached by representative of people that are reasonable, and they operate behind the veil of ignorance. This is a very famous idea. You, you, you forget about your uh, social position, your uh, own vision of philosophy and the good, and, and if your race, your gender, your IQ, your wealth. You forget about everything, and you reason as an abstract representative of a human being. Okay? Of course, these people in the original position, they have to know something, okay? And it defines exactly what they have to know. So it's a very precise language which defines the subspace on which we reach the agreement. So to be fair is it can be agreed upon by these abstract entities, the representatives, okay? Excellent. Now, from here, it deduced some principles about primary goods, and I will not go into this. I want to just quote one sentence, which I think is uh, nevertheless telling. At the end of his uh, thick book, The Theory of Justice, he says, okay, why is my theory so, no, no, he, he never says my, okay? He never used the word I or my in his uh, book, okay? But he says, what is so good about justice and fairness? Because it's perspicuous to our reason, congruent with our notion of the good, and rooted not in abnegation, but in the affirmation of the self. So after 500 pages of argument, he says, okay, this is, uh, I develop something which uh, is, you know, based on reason, it's congruent with different notion of the good, each one has his own notion of the good, but it's congruent with those. And, and this is a telling phrase, okay, nevertheless, it is congruent with the affirmation of the self. So you already see that, okay, he wants to be very objective, he wants to be very ne neutral, but there is an idea of a self that uh, is not retreating, okay? It's not retreating at all, okay? Now, very quickly, because you are much more expert in, on Simon Weil than I am, okay, but I would say that in Simon Weil, in this particular, uh, let's say, in human personality, okay, why are we equal? Okay, we are equal in the vulnerability, as Rita would say, in the possibility to be afflicted. Okay, we are, we are capable of uh, understanding the affliction of others because we know ourselves that we can be afflicted. And what does it mean to be fair, okay? Uh, to be fair means the, a society in which the possibility for this cry to be expressed exists and the possibility of people to hear this cry is there. And stability means inspiration. So it's not just projecting on lower dimensions of space, but okay, it's a, a different language. And okay, again, this is expressed very well in this quote that uh, uh, somebody, I think, yesterday also quoted, uh, in which, uh, you know, what is, what is sacred in every human being is this, uh, uh, this expectation that good be done and not evil. And this is, again, in an even more synthetic form expressed in this, why am I being hurt? This cry that uh, uh, is inside each of us, okay? And of course, from this notion of what makes us equal and what makes something fair, okay, it derives a notion of justice, okay? And she's very explicit, okay? She says, true, if you're talking about why somebody else got more than I have, this is a problem that is interesting, it's, it's not bad, I mean, it's uh, important, but it's a different level from the problem of justice, okay? So she will not do this projection. Okay, you could, uh, you could say that she does a projection, but on a different subspace, on a w wider subspace, okay? So she's very clear that she doesn't want to reduce things to uh, distributive justice, okay? And she talks about justice, uh, truth, and love as uh, uh, 
words that we need to use. So, and I want to conclude with two uh, slides. Okay, first, I think that one can argue in a more detailed way, but I, I, I think I at least hinted at the logic of what I am trying to say, is that if you, start, if you look at Veil through the lenses of roles, but not roles theory of justice, roles the general uh, vocabulary, I think you can claim that uh, this is a basis of a political theory, okay? Maybe not a liberal theory, but of a political in the sense of roles. First of all, it's concerned with the basic structure. Second, it is not a comprehensive doctrine. And on this, okay, I really believe that uh, everybody to which we talked will say to us, very beautiful, but this is religion. It is not religion, okay? So I think that uh, to claim that uh, what makes us equal is that we are able to be afflicted, and so we can understand the affliction of the other, is not less abstract, less impersonal, or less general than to say it is as if we are under a veil of ignorance in a time minus one and looking at time plus one. Okay, it's at least as not a comprehensive doctrine as the other one. And I will also claim that uh, this notion of fair, which is uh, based on this recognition, is a language that exists in society. It is not less natural than the language of the original position. So I think that, uh, in a sense, Rawls, when he defined the abstract notion of a political theory, he did a great service because he created a language on which then he built his own theory, but this language is there, okay, and uh, it is a way to translate, uh, I would say, part at least, of the uh, inspiration of Simon Weil into something which could be understood also by economists, okay? <laughs> and, okay. So, and I, I want to finish with this, okay? In human personality, there are many things in that, in that essay, but there is also a very specific kind of series of recommendations, okay? He, he, she says, well, what does this imply? For example, it implies that public schools should provide means of expression of this cry, okay? So this is a very practical thing, okay? Uh, she talks about uh, communication, uh, you know, newspapers, okay? W newspapers should provide attentive silence in which the cry can make itself heard. And she talks about politics and say, power should be in the hands of men able and anxious to hear the cry, okay? So you see, in a sense, in that essay, she was really trying to bridge the, okay, it is true that if you look at the need for roots, some of the more detailed application are very difficult to, to, to understand today, okay? About the freedom of expression, okay? She says things which are, borderline totalitarian, okay? So I'm not saying that one should take whatever she says and say, okay, I think what I'm saying is that uh, the basic idea that she expresses in human personality, which is there exists an impersonal foundation of equality and justice, is as interesting as Rawls' own theory, and it fits very well Rawls' abstract language. So I think this translation can be done and, uh, okay, we have written this small paper and, tr and we started, but I think, anyway, I think I can stop here, okay? <laughs> yes. So there is a lot to do, but this translation, I think, is possible. So. The quote that you um, uh, adduced, the one about um, uh, uh, why is this happening to me, why this yeah. cry, um, uh, I think in the context, as I recall it, it's not necessarily asking about the uh, origin of this, you know, what's wrong in this situation, what's wrong in this system that allows this to happen. It really is, to what end am I going through this? Uh, it's uh, more a, let's say, um, uh, it's more a spiritual than a political question. I think it can probably be uh, brought to the um, uh, political, but at that point it's um, wanting to know the greater um, ends to which this suffering is happening, not what's wrong with the system so, such that it allows me to feel this suffering. I'm, as I say, I'm not an expert, but this 
quotation, I think, appears also in you in the say human personality, where the issue in a large part of this article is justice. Okay, so as I say, I, do, I don't want to claim uh, exactly where when she said this, but I'm saying that. Uh, in human personality, she's uh, clearly looking for an impersonal foundation of a notion of justice that can be put to practical use. Because in the same essays, she does this abstract description and then she goes into this kind of detail. And I think even at the end of the essay, she really says, it is very good to talk about rights, democracy, person. These are interesting words to be used at, at one level, but there is another level, the level of inspiration, in which, uh, uh, actually, I, I don't think I have it here, okay, but she even used the word projection in a very different sense, okay? Instead of projecting down, she says, okay, institutions should be projected up to this bigger language if we want to have inspiration, okay? And so, okay, in that sense, it has a political also and uh, social, aspect to it. Maybe, yeah. Thank you. You were talking about translation and I was thinking about successful communication because you were also talking about yeah. economists. And I was thinking about the question of aesthetic value of a theory. You were talking about richness and I think it needs to be justified because we can say that richness also complicates things. Uh, we can think about elegance as something that is um, not always goes hand in hand with richness. We can think of Ockham. And then I think the question is why? In what sense is it better uh, uh, to think about roles in, uh, uh, like you did? And I think again the question maybe to sharpen it is whether you're trying to have a better understanding or to make this theory more appealing in the sense of more engaging, uh, more uh, to persuasive to, uh, to adopt it to one's life. And that's two very different uh, targets. And uh, I get the impression that economists care less about engagements than about understanding. Maybe this is the problem. No, I think, uh, okay, I would uh, say this. I, I would say that, uh, you know, there is a branch of economics which is called uh, welfare economics, and uh, the motivation is clearly, so I think, generally speaking, uh, the connection between this part of economics, uh, talking about public policy and uh, intervention in, uh, in um, con you know, controlling the markets, uh, et cetera, every economist knows that, uh, there is at the root of this the willingness to improve society. So in this sense, uh, I don't think uh, they are unaware of uh, the fact that uh, the language that they use and the, what they do is uh, uh, motivated by you know, some will to make the world a better place, okay? But what I think is also true is that uh, this language has been, uh, uh, I don't know, projected down, projected down, projected down to make it more precise. And uh, in a sense, Rawls, okay, it's a very interesting uh, author for us because he looked at the, at the economic language which, uh, with a very uh, deep uh, willingness to understand it and to capture some of uh, the, I know, the power of that language. But at the same time, it came from a richer tradition. So he, he already did a translation, I think. And practically, it is also true that he, talked a course jointly with Ken Arrow and Amartya Sen, two Nobel Prize in economics, for many years. So they were really dialing di all the time. Now, what I think uh, with Aviado, we, <laughs> so we go from Rawls to Aviado and me, but okay, <laughs> fine. No, but okay, but there is, uh, a, the idea is that uh, true, okay, and if you take this book, it is much more um, engaging than, uh, okay, we have, some of our friends write papers like in praise of a mindless economics or uh, you know they really want to say don't talk to me about you know psychology we don't care okay we care about facts okay so this in a sense is already very rich but we have the impression that uh, this which you would say it's the philosophical basis of the welfare state in a sense okay uh, as proved some limitation in practice, okay? Because uh, you could say, for example, the European construction is a case in a Rawlsian uh, construction, and 
the language that is used okay, to motivate uh, the European people to love Europe is very dry because it tries to respect all these boundaries. And why? Okay, we want to argue that the, the boundaries are a bit wider than one would think at first sight. Um, this comparison might actually be uh, the comparison between Vale and Rolls might be less bizarre than it feels to appears to be, due to Rolls apparently having uh, having been a, f a fan of uh, some Catholic doctrine, some Catholic teaching. There is some. There is some literature on the influence of uh, Catholic writers on, on Rawls' ideas. But I actually wanted to ask a, a different question, which is that uh, does your comparison between Rawls and Weil extend to Rawls' meta-ethical uh, presuppositions, namely the idea of justice as fairness, justice as uh, being uh, articulated in a set of rules or a procedure, which is something that Weil might, might not be that keen on. So I was wondering if you could say something about this. So thank you. Okay. Uh, okay. As, uh, what I was trying to hint at is that uh, justice as, as fairness, which is the content of roles, you know, the book Theory of Justice, and then developed and summarized in this latest book, okay, I would claim it's one specific uh, incarnation of some broader uh, structure, and the broader structure is what he calls a political theory of justice, okay, which is defined by these three uh, characteristics which I put at the beginning. Okay? So, in a sense, I think that uh, uh, the idea of uh, hearing the cry of Simon Weil could be a foundation of another political theory, okay? So, uh, I, you're right that uh, the, the specific incarnation that he writes down, so justice as fairness, then moves on, okay? It starts from these abstract uh, concepts, and then, for example, uses the original position and the veil of ignorance, which I don't think uh, Veil uh, would like to use, okay? So, the, the, the specific use of a political theory that Rawls does is very different for one, from what one could be doing with Simon Weil's ideas. But in a sense, I want to argue that Simon Weil's is not a comprehensive doctrine, is not a religious doctrine. It is as political as Rawls would accept, okay? Now, if I have one minute, I want to, because actually it's amazing, I mean, Rawls never talks about himself, okay? He never says, I did this, I did that, I thought this. Okay, there is a footnote in page 34, okay, in which, okay, if I want to read just the tone, okay? The content and tone of one's conception of justice, political or other, is undoubtedly influenced by dueling upon certain facts. So, it's basically, it's basically saying in a footnote in page 34, he says, there is a reason why I'm doing this, okay? He says this in this third mode, but okay. For justice as fairness, which means for me, John Rawls, important among these facts are the endless oppressions and cruelties of state power and inquisition used to sustain Christian unity beginning as early as St. Augustine. So I think this is the only personal footnote in uh, all his work, and he's basically saying there is a reason why I'm trying to be so cold, okay? Because uh, I had a religious belonging, and okay, I think it created a lot of suffering, and uh, I want to avoid this, okay? So he's very honest in trying to be f as far as possible from a hot language. And Simon Weil doesn't do this, and uh, as uh, Robert has shown this morning, this creates a lot of uh, tensions in her work, okay? Because at some point, she seems to, as, to impose the supernatural on, on humans, okay? So what I'm saying is that maybe, maybe there is a, a middle ground between the extreme coldness of one language and uh, this extreme, uh, I don't know, engagement of Simon Weil's language, which still is a place where both have been. Rawls has been there in terms of abstract uh, notions, and Simon Weil, uh, I think, tried to be 
impersonal and objective at some point of our thought. Again, okay? not all of, of our thought. Thank you. So thank you so much, uh, Enrico. And then, of course, with Rita, we have uh, a lot to think about now in uh, comparison with Levinas and uh, now with Rawls. Uh, very, very provocative. Uh, so uh, we should clap for uh, Enrico. Euh, je suis un peu, je ne sais pas si j'ai bien compris, mais vous disiez que euh, on a fait une enquête auprès des gens pour essayer d'amener en fait euh, la notion des, des, euh, du partage, en fait, de, de, de justice, etc., euh, par, le, par des questions qui étaient judicieuses, n'est-ce pas Moi <rire> Ou alors j'ai rien compris. <rire> Non, vous avez, euh, vous, en parlant de Veil et de Rose, oui. 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 Et... Ah. Alors, on a trouvé que la, les gens euh, pouvaient fonder leur comportement sur une espèce d'empathie. Est-ce que j'ai bien compris la capacité à comprendre que, que l'autre souffre, par exemple. C'est vrai Bon, alors, du, euh, ma question, c'est comment faut-il faut réfléchir le fait que, justement, le nazi ne n'avait ne, ne, pas cette empathie okay. Merci. Bon, on aura le temps pour encore une question, si il y en a. Oui, en, en fait, je ne sais pas, <rire> il y a peut-être un problème de traduction de langage, mais disons, je n'ai pas parlé d'une enquête dans, parmi les gens, mais je disais que en, le principe que Simon Veil propose comme base pour définir ce qui est juste, okay, était la, ré, la reconnaissance de, de la, la vulnérabilité de l'autre, si on veut utiliser ce langage. Donc, ce n'est pas une, une, une enquête parmi les gens, c'est une proposition. Okay? Et, et justement, je pense que Simon Veil est, était très, très critique des Romains d'abord et des, des nazis à son temps, justement pour l'absolu incapacité de, de percevoir ça. Donc, est-ce qu'on peut trouver une direction pour euh, poser la question comment peut-on ne pas euh, être sensible à, à la vulnérabilité mm -hmm. mm -hmm. donc si je peux préciser ma question est-ce qu'on peut trouver euh, la question qui permettrait de réfléchir au pourquoi dans quelle situation, à cause de quoi on peut arriver, on peut en arriver à ne pas ressentir euh, l'injustice de la situation dans laquelle se trouve quelqu'un. Ok, je peux répondre par exemple avec l'actualité en Italie cet été, pour, vous, pour être très concret. Okay Donc, euh, nous sommes en train en Italie de voir un moment où la politique euh, change les langages que les gens utilisent. Okay. Donc, euh, c'est des mouvements... Nous, nous vivons tous dans, dans un milieu social où les langages euh, changent. Okay. Change parce que l'opinion publique, les journaux et les politiciens ont, ont un rôle très important parce qu'ils ils, ils ont une, une visibilité et ils définissent les mots que les gens utilisent. Okay. Donc, ça, c'est des phénomènes qui ont eu lieu dans les années 30 euh, en Italie et euh, en Allemagne. Et il y a quelque chose de similaire en, dans différents endroits du monde, euh, aussi aux États-Unis. Mais, par exemple, en Italie, il y a eu vraiment un changement. C'est-à-dire, on, on est délaissé des gens sur euh, des bateaux dans, dans la mer pendant deux, trois semaines. Et, je ne sais pas. 60 personnes, okay. donc euh, comme si c'était un problème insoluble pour l'État italien qui a 60 millions d'habitants. Okay. Euh, C'est horrible, non ça, ça devient euh, acceptable parce qu'on le répète, on le répète, on le répète, on, on, crée, on crée une narration qui dit c'est un problème insoluble, il faut... Et on ne voit plus l'autre. 
Donc, euh, c'est très concret. C'est des choses qui, qui peuvent se passer. Disons, je ne pense pas que ce soit naturel. Disons, chaque être humain, si elle était devant une, une femme avec des enfants qui est à la mer pendant une semaine sous le soleil et qui, qui ne sait pas ce qui se passe de sa vie, aurait compassion. Mais si on met ça dans un cadre d'une narration, euh, c'est très facile à faire. C'est-à-dire que le langage est très puissant, la propagande est très puissante et on, ça marche très bien. Well, it's kind of a continuation of the last question. Um, you you put kind of in the in the center of your beautiful attempt to project uh, Weil's multi-dimensional thinking into the dimensions uh, of the liberal thinking. You put in the center of it the notion that um, she says that we are all equally vulnerable to. Um, affliction and thus we can all understand affliction but actually she writes a lot about the opposite right that okay and uh, so it it connects to what you said that there's a great part of it that okay you said yes yes so maybe i don't need to continue <laughs> you, yes and so she writes about how Just because we're all so vulnerable to affliction and we can't bear to know it, we just kind of turn away from knowing the affliction of others and convince ourselves that the same thing cannot happen to us, that we cannot be refugees even if we have been refugees or, well, actually we, ho we all can be refugees, but we don't see it and we turn away from it. And she talks about it very uh, precisely. She even says that the afflicted person themselves turn away from their own affliction and are unable to bear knowing uh, the situation and to be compassionate compassionate towards themselves even and so and this i think this is a problem for the translation you're trying to make to liberal uh, talk because it's kind of the the these mechanisms that kind of um, hide away um The affliction, there are, like liberal language is one central mechanism in our society and especially in the past but still in the present of hiding away uh, the affliction of people. And the people who are afflicted are unable to talk in this language. This is also something that she talks about. So it seems to me there is a contradiction um, between trying to give a uh, language and speech to the afflicted and trying to talk in liberal language. It also relates a little bit to, to talking about America and the American narrative of uh, you know, being the, the, the land of the free while actually terrible things were happening and this narrative was used to uh, make them happen. Uh, so. so I think, uh, okay. It is very true that uh, she repeats, uh, I mean, and I also put the silent cry, okay, in, as the title of the slide, exactly because uh, th that's important. But at the same time, if we talk about Simone Weil, okay, it is clear that uh, uh, she was nevertheless, uh, in a sense, pushing for a richer language and the fact that politics could play a role in uh, uh, helping uh, people to be sensible to this, uh, to this um, cry, okay? So I think one thing is to say that uh, when you're afflicted, you cannot even speak your affliction and that to be attentive to afflicted person, person can be self-destructive even for you, okay? So she says things like this, but at the same time, she keeps repeating that uh, these words should be used and okay he, he, she also has this practical implication about schools and you know, newspapers so i think she was nevertheless hoping that you could uh, uh, enlarge the domain of uh, okay now concerning the liberal thought okay i just want to say one thing which is that uh, the word liberal has many meanings okay now i i was reading and this is why i think john rawls 
it's such an important uh, contributor to to our thinking because he, he worked with uh, extreme intellectual honesty to define every term and to be you know working on the meaning of every word so he has a very specific meaning of what he calls a political theory of justice and this meaning is this three property okay which is uh, to be not a moral comprehensive theory and uh, to be expressed uh, in the in the language of uh, of uh, of used by people uh, for example to say this okay to be to use uh, okay either you say that compassion is not part of human experience or you m might argue that to use these words is allowed in a political field for example for this specific issue you see so because he defines it he, he says it should be based on uh, concepts which are used in the public uh, discourse, okay? So he uses reasonable as, for his own theory, he uses the concept of being reasonable because he says this is part of our experience. When we go, when we are in a community, when we are in a group, we try to understand the reason of the other people. So we are not just selfish and rational, but we are, okay. At, on the same level, you could argue that it's part of human experience to be able of perceiving the affliction of the other, okay? It's maybe harder, but it's part of uh, something that we all feel. So this is the sense in which I think that uh, this language is not, not legitimate. It is a legitimate language for his own criterion. Not for his own theory, okay? As Dan has said, he has a particular theory, but this, you know, is very clear. He says, this is my proposal, but there is a wider structure, and I think that's, um, anyway.